Dear friends, Exodus is a myth. And I say so because I am getting tired of all those claims of finding the Ark of Covenant or looking for it or finding submerged Egyptian chariots in the Red Sea, proofs of Israelites in Egypt, endless arguments about Israelite occupation and settlement in Palestine, maps of Israelite journeys through the Sinai Peninsula and even locating Mount Sinai itself where Moses received the Decalogue. All of that is an utter and absurd folly. Of course, many places do exist. Many described customs, religious rituals, and so on, simply realities, resemble those on ground at some historical point in ancient times. But that is the very nature of a myth. A myth, here I am quoting from Encyclopedia Britannica, a myth is a symbolic narrative, usually of unknown origin and at least partly traditional, that ostensibly relates actual events and that is especially associated with religious beliefs. It is an important distinction to make between history and myth. Accepting it as a myth allows us much better understanding of the story, of story itself, and the way it relates to and describes the world. In the words of, which are ascribed to ancient philosopher Salustius, myths are stories which never were and always are. And for this claim that Exodus is a myth, there are many reasons. Historical and archaeological arguments, religious or phenomenological argument, and argument from the literary style. I want to start with historical and archaeological argument. Exodus certainly never happened as described in the Bible and within the historical frame into which it is being cast or projected. There are no real signs in Egypt, in Sinai, or in Palestine. And we can take it one after another. On Egyptian side, there is, of course, a long history of Semitic people living in Egypt and they left there plenty of artifacts. But they were polytheists. From those artifacts we can read it. They were Canaanites. Many biblical data provided to us in the Bible uh, of locations, names and so on are either contradictory or anachronistic. So on Egyptian side we don't have that much to really base that story in history. Secondly, in Sinai, there is, again, a long history of very sparse population living there or going through that territory. Shepherds and copper industry, for instance, copper mining industry. There is a known network of roads and paths and their infrastructure even. But there are no archaeological signs of migration of that size, of thousands upon thousands of people, or even much smaller. So in Sinai, there are no traces of that. Thirdly, on a Palestine side, at the destination, there are no signs of a sudden momentous influx of population and settlement. There are no signs of synchronous cultural disruption and replacement of one population 
by another. So even in Palestine, there are no signs of exodus. This absence of historical or archaeological signs of migration or equivalent to exodus of Semitic people from Egypt to Palestine is even more interesting or stunning because there are signs of similar migration historically provable, archaeologically founded migration in this area and in that period into which Exodus is more or less cast. And that is an arrival and a settlement of sea people along the coast, approximated as the biblical Philistines who came from the north and settled there. You can even trace those individual steps which there need to be for uh, this migration and resettlement or settlement and resettlement. That is cultural distinction, different language, different pottery, replacement of the previous population and clear cultural and linguistic discontinuity. And there are also traceable roads of migration archaeologically, historically, and also those which make sense and are plausible. And all of that is about sea people, biblical Philistines, not about Israelites coming through Sinai. Finally, biblical narrative is a mishmash of historical and cultural realities, which is exactly a characteristic for the myth or legends and if you want to extrapolate it for fairy tales facts are to give impression of plausibility they are not to be deeply studied investigated and cross examined and dear friends that leads me to religious argument the exodus or its main story its main plot is a version of Hauskampf myth. That's a technical term am among students of religion. It is the fight against the forces of chaos. Hero God defeating monster of chaos and creating the world out of its corpse. That's at least one version of that. It is datable back to the 24th century before Common Era in Assyrian text. That's at least our first instance where we are aware of it. And then it's present in Enuma Elish or in the fight of God Baal with God Yam, that means sea, in Ugaritic texts vanquishing sea monster, splitting the sea, creating cosmos out of chaos, walking through sea or walking on waves, controlling the storm. And here you can also, among these images, capture some traces of much later echoes from the New Testament times. Now, Exodus is, of course, substantial myth. Chaos Camp is in its core, that's its organizing principle. But there are many side stories before, during and after Exodus. And they have also mythical parallels or discernible mythical grounding or legendary grounding. So, for instance, Jewish midwives early in Exodus they, their names and their function closely resembles goddesses kosheroth from Ugaritic texts, goddesses of childbearing, or Moses being drawn from the river in a basket, is paralleled very closely by much older Sargon legend telling about the origins of this emperor. The story of circumcision 
is pointing in Exodus to marriage ritual, which is much older, clearly, than what it later became within the Judaism. Another part example might be destruction of Korahites being swallowed by the earth, but more underground, nether world. Ideology of Nehushtan as a bronze serpent, or ideology of different springs throughout Sinai Peninsula. Those are examples, just few, of those side stories or details which are filling in that main framework of Exodus. Then many biblical, prophetic and psalmodic passages which are being interpreted as later reflection or pointers towards Exodus could easily be just the reworking of Hauskampf myth and quite possibly not consequences of Exodus, but in fact the sources from which Exodus myth came into existence. Thus, Exodus myth has some very deep roots. As mentioned, the first known example of Hauskampf is dated to the third millennium before Common Era. And some other side stories, some of which I mentioned, themes are also very old. But the age of any of these parts does not say anything about its own age and certainly does not prove historical reality, veracity of the entire narrative. In its current form, as preserved in the Torah, it is a very late reworking of these ancient themes. And here we come to the white elephant in the room. Argument from the literary style. Exodus story in the Torah is predominantly written in prose. That's important. All the ancient myths and legends were always written as epic poetry. Gilgamesh, Enuma Elish, Descent of Inanna, Ugaritic myths, all of that is poetry. And going to a different linguistic realm among the Greeks, Homer is also poetry. Storytelling in prose became a thing only around the time of Herodotus. That means 5th century before Common Era. And that can serve as terminus postquem. That means after which, the point after which these narratives can come into existence for Exodus. But frankly, that's really terminus. That means the, the very point from which they might appear most likely they started to be put together later in Hellenistic period from Alexander the Great onward. And so these are historical, archaeological, religious and literary reasons to consider Exodus for a myth. And in its current form, as it is inscribed in the Bible, a relatively late myth at that. And that is something not many know or admit or acknowledge about the Bible.